Welcome to the Ask a Swim Pro show. My name is Ferris Savetti, co-founder and CEO of My Swim Pro. And today I'm joined by a special guest. Summer Sanders joins us from Utah. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. So Summer is an Olympian, a TV host, a author, mom, wife. Uh, she's kind of done everything. So this is a really unique opportunity to speak with someone who's been around the world uh, in a number of different ways. Can you tell us about what your current routine is looking like these days? I know we're social distancing and there's a lot going on. What, what's that been like? Well, like you said, I'm a mom. I have two kids. Uh, my daughter's 13. She's in eighth grade and my son is 12 and he is in sixth grade. So the biggest change really has been homeschooling. Um, and, and I say that I'm not homeschooling. They have all their curriculum from their teachers uh, online. But there is a lot of support that's needed, um, I think, for kids right now, which is a bit different than sending them off to school. I personally have loved it. So we get up every morning a little bit later, much later, actually, than we would if the kids were going to school, which I think is really nice. My daughter was getting up at 6 a.m., catching the bus at 6.50 now she's not waking up till nine. She starts her day much later, which I like. I like the fact that she gets to sleep in. So we'll have breakfast together. They start their school. I go out and I exercise. We walk, we do lots of walks with the dogs. Um, and yeah, the day just begins from there. Mm -hmm. what, what advice do you have for everyone who's now in that homeschooling position and everyone's not used to the new routine and, you know, they're trying to work out, their kids are working out or not working out. What, what do you tell them. I know. And a lot of parents are working from home too. Right. So that like the challenge, frankly, is internet space and speed. Mm -hmm. um, and there has been frustration from my kids that our internet is just not fast enough. Like they're, you know, the wheel is just spinning and spinning and spinning on their Mac. And, and it, you know, we do have to, to just go ahead and take a deep breath because it's a great problem to have that we all have computers and we still get to continue with online school. Um, but it does get frustrating at times. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it's, it's, um, it's a great opportunity to check in with your kids, you know, really take the time to sit down with them and help them with schoolwork, challenge yourself with their math. I mean, I'll sit down with my sixth grader and try to do math with him. And I'm like, Wait a second. I was once a smart human being. Um, so yes. Yeah, so take the time now. Don't say later. If they need help, help them now. Sit down and attempt to do it together. And it really does connect you with what they're learning and what they're doing, doing in school, which I think is a really positive part of us being in shelter in place right now. Mm -hmm. And what, what was it like? I was going to go backwards in time. I know you were in Spain. What was that experience like? Tell us about that. Well, I have to say, so it, the, the, the way we're living right now is, is not that much. It's very similar to the way um, we were living in Spain. The kids went to school. They went to public school in Spain. But the way I was helping them with their homework and we were always checking in with them on things and, and we were really within our four walls a lot of the time in Spain and relied on the, you know, our family time together is very similar to the way we're living right now. So for me, there's a little comfort in that. But, um, but yes, living abroad for a year was phenomenal. It was, I've said it to everyone, the best way I can describe it is it was the best decision of our lives. Um, it just, it brings your family together. It's a, it's something you treasure forever. My 12 year old son who was so hesitant and didn't want to leave his friends in the U.S. and was so hesitant to go away for a year. Um, now, probably like two months ago said, oh, I miss Spanish school. I miss being there. I miss my friends. So it's a very special time. Mm -hmm. And what, what advice do you have for people who are they're kind of, they feel trapped, right? You know, they, they may not see the, the positivity like some other people. And, you know, their, their swim meets got canceled. They're, you know, they're looking at it from that perspective. How do they stay connected, motivated for the next thing that's coming up? I know. I, first of all, I have empathy for, for um, the frustration, the worry, the anxiety. I get it. It's very real. Um, and it's heavy for a lot of these young athletes right now, mostly because it's very uncertain, right? I, I was just talking the other day with my husband about, about the athletes that were maybe entering their spring uh, sports in, mm. in high school. And this was going to be their big time to show all the college recruits, like this is who I am. 
junior yeah. year, you know, and, and they don't have that. And so I guess the first thing I can, I can say is for all these young athletes, at some point in your career, your sport career, or just general career, things are not going to go well. And this might be one of them, right? Unexpected, um, not according to plan. And that's when you just have to trust all the hard work that you've put in and it will be there for you. It's like all that hard work is this deposit, this super secure deposit that you put into your work bank and none of that can be taken out. And that's going to be there for you at some point when you call upon it. So I don't want these young athletes to get so overwhelmed with the fact that they don't have these meets to go to. They don't have the training as they've seen it for all this time. Figure something, figure something out within your swimming career, within your swimming, your, your stroke, your, your, uh, just whether it's you're not flexible enough, something about you that you'd like to work on and take this time and work on it authentically the way you would do meters and meters and meters in the swim pool. Work on something that you've been meaning to do for a long time. Mm -hmm. And over the last, uh, all the Olympic games that you've uh, been a part of from a, from a TV hosting perspective, what are some, some moments that you, that stand out to you as, you've seen adversity or maybe just fun moments that, that you remember? Well, I'll tell you, um, so my Olympic games were 1992 and 11 months before my Olympic trials, I hurt my shoulder. Um, so I'll just make it real personal, first of all. Um, so I hurt my shoulder and my coach at the time, Richard Quick, took me to a you know, world-renowned uh, orthopedic surgeon in Palo Alto and they tested my shoulder, yada, yada. In the end, people didn't get MRIs back then. We weren't like x-rayed all the time. So he said, it's overuse. She needs to be out of the water. She can't swim for like a month and a half, which is the worst diagnosis and prescription that a swimmer can get, rest, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I was in the water. I was swimming with one arm until that shoulder got sore. And then I was kicking with zoomers until I got a ton of um, blisters around my feet. And then I put socks on and put my zoomers back on. And then that just didn't work. And so each, each step, and we're talking like just a couple of days, you know, with each step, I was more defeated and more defeated. And then, um, and then Richard had me sitting on the side of the pool doing a stand up bike. And I'd be sitting there exercising while I was watching all my friends in the water doing what I always knew was the best thing for swimmers to do, swim. And I just kept thinking, I'm getting so behind, I'm getting so behind. And Richard said to me, he pulled me aside. He knew I was just like almost at my wit's end. And he said, uh, what's the one thing that you need to be working on right now? Like, what's the weakness in your swimming? And I said, my kick. And he goes, that's what you're doing. You're getting your legs stronger. You're, you're, be, you're being given the opportunity to make your weakness um, not a weakness anymore. So uh, in that moment, I sort of thought of things differently and I got through it. But I go, if you fast forward 23 years, I was golfing, I hurt my shoulder, I went into the orthopedic surgeon here in Park City and he did an MRI, the full MRI that you do now. And he's like, you've had a slap tear in your shoulder for over two decades. And I was like, I won my Olympic gold medals with a slap tear in my shoulder. And uh, you know, so mind never matter in a lot of these instances where you can accomplish really great things um, when you just decide that it's, it's what you want to do. I've seen amazing Olympic moments. Um, I, before I even made the Olympic team, I saw Joan Benoit win the very first women's marathon in 1984, one of the greatest moments ever. I saw, I don't remember her name, but I saw one of the, the last women to cross the finish line in that marathon and she was wobbling all over the track equally emotional and um monumental moment in my life i've seen i saw kathy freeman win her gold medal in australia i've seen countless hundred meters on the track which if you've never been to 100 meters at the olympic games you've not witnessed the most amazing um collective unity in silence and then flash bulbs when the light goes up. I mean, it's just, what, what are we talking? 70, 80,000 people 
all as quiet as can be for the start of the 100 meters. And then the moment the gun goes off, flash bulbs everywhere. I mean, truly remarkable. So I am so grateful that I get to work Olympic Games and I've worked so many of them. It's, uh, it's not lost on me how amazing the Olympics are. So when you describe that 100 meter and everyone's silent, I actually had an adrenaline pump and a hair has actually stood up on my arm. What, what, what's that been like uh, to have seen so much of the evolution of sports over the last couple of decades and to be a part of it? I mean, it's, you're not just spectating, you're actually you know, involved. You know, wh walk me through what, what that was like. Well, I think it's, it's truly amazing, you know, sitting here now as a 47 year old and knowing that, so my first Olympic games I witnessed as a fan was 1984 when I was 11, just about 12 years old. And, um, to watch what Peter Uberoth did with those games, all the recycling that was going on. It was one of the, I think it was the first Olympic games to actually make money as opposed to only lose money. Um, and, and then to watch 1992 happen, which was really the first of many NBC Olympic Games. Um, but I felt like Barcelona was still sort of one of the, the, the old school Olympic Games, right? It had, we had no inter yet, internet yet. We had no cell phones. It was, it was still so pure and innocent. And, and then Atlanta to me was just, um, you know, a bit, like a Disneyland uh, takeover, like the biggest premiere of all premieres. It was NBC's really big showcase. And, and from that point, I saw the Olympic Games uh, change a little bit, right? I mean, you could say for the good, for the bad, but these athletes began to really be able to make money. And you saw athletes' careers extend. Uh, so they could graduate college um, start to make money and, and com compete not just one Olympic Games, my goodness, three, four Olympic Games, which used to be really difficult to do. I mean, when I won my gold medal, um, I, I, for, I won two golds, a silver and a bronze, and I got a check for $1,250, $1,250 for, for all those medals. Um, you got that check if you, qualif if you were top eight in one event, and then that was it. You, you fast forward to 1996, and I believe that's when they started earning money for their medals, $25,000 for gold and something else. So the progression of that, pe some people don't like it, some people love it, um, but it definitely did extend the careers of these amazing athletes. Mm -hmm. And to follow up on that, where do you see the sport moving in the next uh, you know, five, 10 years? Because that's really accelerated, I feel like, in the last like since my swimming career in the last 10, 15 years, it's completely different now. Yeah, I, I actually think what's happening right now will have an effect on the way an Olympic Games is put together. There's so much money in an Olympic Games, right? We are uh, not-for-profit, the IOC, the USOC, um, and this postponing of an Olympic Games, it will be interesting to see how that affects everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I do think it will it possibly will put to the forefront this uh, this platform to change the culture of a new city every four years for the Olympic Games. I would really, really love to see them reusing Olympic sites. I live in Park City, Utah. We have mm -hmm. uh, the Utah Olympic Park literally seven minutes from my house where my kids, they go and do ski team there during the, the winter time. Utah yeah. does a really good job of keeping up all these parks. I think we have to raise like $30 million a year to keep all of our uh, Utah Olympic legacy um, uh, locations up and running. Um, so they're ready to go. It, it, I, I think we have to start recycling these Olympic um, sites because there's there to me seems to be a lot of money invested into these cities yeah. and I don't think it's viable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I agree. The, the reuse of these outstanding facilities is probably going to need to be a reality for sustainability. Um, and don't you think that this moment right now is inspiring maybe that change of heart, right? Really looking at the health of the city and the countries and the expense of it all? I think the new normal, as they say, after this pandemic, it, a lot of things are going to change public health, sports. I, I we will find out, and uh, I'm curious to see what the world, you know, adapts, how we adapt to that. So yeah, 
really interesting. I want to, so the, with the team at my Soon Pro, I was really excited to, to have you on. Um, we, we were talking about the TV shows that you were, yes. um, one of them figure it out on Nickelodeon. So uh, <laughs> that was a special request by the team. Tell us about that. What was your favorite part of it? I mean, they, they would be so ashamed at me if I didn't say the slime. The mess and the slime uh, was absolutely yeah. my favorite part. It was, I mean, it, I, we, my kids and I watch Game of Games now. It's mm -hmm. Ellen DeGeneres' show. And there's so much about that show that's very similar to the messiness um, and the, spo like the spontaneous comedy of uh, my Figured Out show. It was, mm -hmm. um, it was the purest form of comedy. It's just young kids their crazy collections, talents, inventions, and slime everywhere. Um, it, yeah, I, I loved the kids and, and not just the contestants, but that generation, the people that you work with, right, that were super excited, that generation of young people that watched Nickelodeon at that time, it was, yes, it's a generation that has a very special place in my heart, absolutely. Nice. Did you always see yourself going into the TV side of things? Yeah, it's it's funny. I think a lot of people assume I just took my sport and then moved it into television. Um, I always wanted to work in television. So I was itching to get into television. Um, and that's why I retired from swimming. There was one moment when I just, I was like, why, what am I doing? Like, I know what I want to do. And I put a pros and cons sheet together of like why I would stay around and continue to swim. And I just was, I was ready to start my life and that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I started auditioning for every show that I could, um, that was respectable. Um, <laughs> and you know, the first show I got was MTV, a show called Sandblast. Um, and I remember all the, all the producers being, Oh, your life is about to change forever. You're on MTV. And, it was just this sense of like, oh my gosh, this is weird. Uh, <laughs> and, then I, and then I ended up going back to swimming. And uh, when I didn't make the team in 1996, I had like a 10 month comeback period. And when I didn't make the team in 96, that's when I was like, I was officially ready to be done. I was, I was so grateful for the experience I had in 1992 and ready to say goodbye to it and then fully dive into my Olympic career. I mean, sorry, my television career. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I want to finish on is you're an author and you've published a book that I think circles back to what we talked about in the beginning of the interview with, you know, the importance of parenting. Tell me about the book. So my, my book is called Champions Are Raised, Not Born, How My Parents Made Me a Success. Um, I wrote, the, the book was sort of inspired by autograph sessions and, um, Back in the day when you were hired by a company, you'd usually sit at a table for a couple hours at a business and you'd sign autographs. And I had many parents coming up to me saying, now, how did your parents get you into the Olympic trials? Or how did your parents get you into the Olympics? Because little Johnny here is really talented and I want to make sure I get him in. And I just thought, oh, maybe, maybe parents need to better understand um, how little, but yet the little things they did were so impactful how little my parents did to get me in the olympics really it has to come from the athlete themselves so um i used other olympic athletes and some anecdotes from them it was dan jansen bonnie blair uh karch karai um debbie thomas so many many people from my generation on just uh, little little stories about what their parents did monumental moments of driving hours. I think, I think it was even Bonnie Blair who's like, my dad drove hours and hours and hours. And we got to a, a, a speed skating race. And I just said, it's too cold. I'm not going. And, and he's, she's like, my dad went out and he timed and he did his job and came back and then we drove home. But it was um, that she, I think she said, that's the moment when I realized, hmm, this is about like, if I want to do this, it has to come down to me because my dad's you know, it's just, you have to have the inner drive. So that's why I wanted to write it. It, um, I wish I could update it because I really do have more stories now. And, and I guess there's only one way to do it and that's to write another book. <laughs> awesome. 
uh, we will link the the prior book, the first book. We will link that in the description. Um, Summer, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and share your enthusiasm and all of the awesome stories uh, with us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Stay safe, stay healthy. Take care. Bye. Bye.